Hello everyone. This is Ashraf Hassanpour from Shiraz University of Medical Sciences, Anatomical Department. In this lecture, we are going to discuss the bones of the viscerocranium. As we've discussed in the previous section, the skull is divided into two parts, the viscerocranium and the neurocranium. The word viscerocranium simply refers to the bones that form the face. The neurocranium, on the other hand, refers to the bones that house and protect the brain. Also, in the previous section, we looked at, at the bones of the neurocranium individually. In today's lecture, we are going to be covering the bones of the viscerocranium, including the nasal bones, the maxillae, the zygomatic bones, the mandible, and etc. So, let's start at the center of the face where we find two small paired bones known as the nasal bones. And these bones define your nose, determining its shape and size. And, as you probably have guessed, yes, these are the anterior and the lateral views of your nasal bones. Now, the superior borders and the main bodies form the bridge of the nose, while the inferior borders connect with the nasal cartilage to then form the superior margin of the nasal aperture. Then, here, we have lacrimal bones. The lacrimal bones are the smallest and most fragile bones of the face. As you can see, they are located in the medial wall of the orbit. The lacrimal bones contain the foramen of the nasolacrimal ducts, as also known as tear ducts. Now, moving on to the other walls of the orbit. As you can see in this image, the inferior and lateral borders of the orbit are formed by the paired zygomatic bones. Remember that the superior borders of the orbit are formed by the frontal bone, which is part of the neurocranium. The zygomatic bones protrude laterally, forming eminences on the face called cheekbones. Each zygomatic bone is comprised of three parts which are named according to the bones they articulate with. The frontal process, the temporal process, and the maxillary part, which is not a process but refers more to the part of the bone that communicates with the maxillary bone just here. Okay, so here we can see the maxillary. The maxillary is a paired bone consisting of the right and left maxilla which fuse in the midline. And it's also known as the upper jaw and is a vital structure of visceral cranium. It's involved in the formation of the bony orbit as well as the nose and the palate. And it holds the upper or maxillary teeth. So therefore, plays an important role in mastication and communication. The maxilla consists of the body and its four projections. Frontal process, zygomatic process, palatine process, and the alveolar process. The body of maxilla contributes to the anterior margin and the floor of the bony orbits and the anterior wall of the nasal cavity. Lateral to the nasal cavity, each maxilla contains a large espicious cavity called the maxillary sinus, which extends from the orbital ridge to the alveolar process. The infraorbital foramen is located underneath the orbital ridge and serves as a pathway for the infraorbital nerve and vessels. Within the orbit, this foramen extends along the infraorbital groove. The alveolar process 
is an inferior extension of maxilla with a rather porous structure. It forms the maxillary dental arch containing eight cavities where the upper teeth are held. Laterally, each maxilla articulates with a zygomatic bone via a zygomatic process. The palatine process is a horizontal extension on the medial side of the bone constituting the roof of the mouth and the floor of the nasal cavity. Together with the palatine bone, it forms the heart palate. The united maxillae form a prominent anterior nasal spine along the inferior surface of the nasal cavity. Superiorly, the maxillae articulate with the frontal bones via frontal processes. And lastly, the incisive foramen can be found on the median line just posteriorly to the incisor teeth where the nasopalatine nerve and greater palatine vessels pass through. Let's move on onto the next bone, here, that we can see from a posterior view of our skull. This bone is known as the palatine bone. The palatine bone is a paired bone located between the maxillae and the trigoid process of the sphenoid bone. It composed of two plates, the horizontal plate and the perpendicular plate, which are connected and form a characteristic L-shaped bone. Please note that together with the palatine process of the maxilla, they form the bones of the heart palate. Also, the bone features three processes, orbital, sphenoidal, and pyramidal process, which as you can see here, is located between the sphenoid bone and the maxilla. So by these structures, the palatine bone participates in building the three cavities within the skull, the oral cavity, the nasal cavity, and the orbits. The next bones are inferior nasal conchi. Within the nasal cavity, there are three pairs of nasal conchi. These are projections of thin rolled bone which humidify, warm, filter, and directs the air we breathe. The superior nasal concha and the middle nasal concha are projections of the ethmoid bone and are considered part of the neurocranium. However, the inferior nasal concha do not project from the ethmoid bone and instead are considered separate facial bones. They are also typically the most visible conchi through the anterior nasal aperture. In the nasal cavity, also we have vomer bone. The vomer is a singular bone that runs vertically within the nasal cavity, separating the left and right sides. The vomer has a triangular shape, and when we view it laterally, resembles a farming polo. It articulates along its midline with both the maxillae and the palatine bones. Its curved thin horizontal projection, called the ala, meaning wing, articulates superiorly with the sphenoid bone. The vertical plate of the vomer articulates with the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. Anteriorly, both the vomer and the perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone form the bony nasal septum. Now this time I am going to be dealing with the mandible. The mandible forms the entire lower jaw and it's the only bone in the entire cranium that does not articulate with its adjacent skull bones via any sutures. It supports the inferior teeth and provides attachment for muscles of mastication. The mandible has a horizontal body and two vertical to oblique ascending posterior regions called the rami. Each ramus 
meet the body at a corner called the angle of the mandible. The point of the chi is the mental protuberance. On the anterolateral surface of the body, a mental foramen penetrates the body on each side of the chin to provide a passageway for nerves and blood vessels. The alveolar part of the mandible is a thickened area that contains the alveoli and the roots of the teeth. On the medial wall of each ramus, here, you can see mylohyoid line. At the mylohyoid line, the mylohyoid muscle inserts to support the tongue and the filler of the mouth. At the posterior superior end of each mylohyoid line, a prominent mandibular foramen provides a passageway for blood vessels and nerves that innervate the inferior teeth. The condylar processes extend to the smooth articular surface of the head of the mandible. The head articulates with the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone at the temporomandibular joint, TMG. This joint is quiet mobile that allows us to move the lower jaw when we talk and chow. Well, the disadvantage of such mobility is that forceful anterior or lateral movements of the mandible can easily dislocate the jaw. The anterior projection of the ramus, termed the cranoid process, is the insertion point for the temporalis muscle, a powerful muscle involved in closing the mouth. This U-shaped depression between the two processes is called the mandibular notch. Okay, now that we've covered all the bones of the skull, it's time for us to move on and talk about the last topic in this lecture, the cranial sutures. The boundaries between skull bones are immovable joints called sutures. At a suture, the bones are joined firmly together with dense fibrous connective tissue. Each of the sutures of the skull has a name. Many of the smaller sutures are named for the bones or features they interconnect. For example, the occipitomastoid suture connects the occipital bone with the mastoid process. But you need to know only four major sutures at this time. The lambdoid, sagittal, coronal, and the scamous sutures. The coronal suture extends across the superior surface of the skull along a coronal or frontal plane. It represents the articulation between the anterior frontal bone and the posterior parietal bones. The next suture is lambdoid suture. The lambdoid suture extends like an arc across the posterior surface of the skull, articulating with the parietal bones and the occipital bone. It's named for the Greek letter lambda, which its shape resembles. One common variation in sutures is the presence of sutural bones or vormian bones. Sutural bones typically are small, but they can be much larger sometimes. Any suture may have sutural bones, but they are most common and numerous in the lambdoid suture. The next suture on our list is going to be the sagittal suture. The sagittal suture extend between the superior midlines of the coronal and the lambdoid sutures. It's in the midline of cranium along the mid-sagittal plane and is the articulation between the right and left parietal bones. Okay, the last suture that we are going to be covering known as the scamous suture. A scamous suture on each side of the skull articulates the temporal bone and the parietal bone of that side. The ascomus part of the temporal bone typically overlaps the parietal bone. And as you can see, this suture is part or makes part of the region 
known as the trillion. And you may be asking, what is the trillion? Well, actually, trillion includes the egg-shaped set of sutures where the frontal bone, the greater wing of the sphenoid bone, the parietal bone, and the temporal are meeting here. This is an important site because the anterior division of the middle meningeal artery lies deep to the trillion. In roadside accidents, this artery at trillion may be ruptured, leading to clot formation between the skull bone and dura mater, or extradura hemorrhage. Okay, thanks for sticking with me throughout this lecture. In the next lecture, I am going to be talking about the different views of the skull and describing the different structures that can be seen from these views. Actually, in the next lecture, we will review all the structures we've learned until now. Happy studying and thanks for watching!